Um, so yeah, I, um, as um, Valerie just mentioned, I, I, I work in Australia right now, um, a location you might have heard of called Sydney, and uh, the most beautiful city in the world, as I, as I tell my friends. Um, just moved there actually just a year ago, uh, and I have a dual role. I work once uh, in one half of the week at the CSRO, uh, which is actually um, one of the largest um, national research infrastructures uh, in the world. So it's six and a half thousand scientists spanning uh, effectively all disciplines. Um, and has, has had a number of uh, large, um, prominent uh, successes, including YLAN. <clears throat> uh, and the other half of the week, uh, I'm at a place called the Garvin uh, Institute for Medical Research, uh, quite a smaller, uh, more focused institute, uh, looking at a range of uh, important um, diseases. And we actually sit directly in a sub part of the garden called the Kinghorn, which is a recently opened center focusing on combining genetic approaches to, to the treatment of cancer. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about structures, but I'm going to also put it a little bit into context um, for the rest of the audience who, who perhaps have less grounding in that. Um, and also by way of introducing the following speakers who are going to probably give more, um, more detailed talks. So one thing I, I, I liked very much a couple of years ago in, in the same uh, auditorium, uh, Nick Luscombe, he, uh, he was a, he's more of a, um, a straight up biologist doing a lot of um, both combination of bioinformatics and experimental biology. And we, when we asked him his opinion about the use of visualization for him, uh, he, th he thought, well, really there's four key frameworks or frames of reference that they use um, as a visualization um, platform. One is genome browsers, which we've heard a lot about in the first session. Second would be heat maps, which is uh, a very widely used way of analyzing multivariate data in biology. And then there's networks, which we're going to hear more about in the coming session. And what is going to be fo the focus of this session is really uh, spatial data, particularly molecular spatial data. And for those of you who may think that molecular biology or structural biology rather is perhaps not the most exciting field. Um, I'm going to try and win you over there. Um, so it, it's really difficult to understate the significance of structural biology. It's the foundation obviously of the uh, of modern molecular biology uh, comes from the, the understanding of how molecules are arranged, how obviously the molecule of life, but uh, after the discovery of the basic structure of DNA, which wasn't really an atomic resolution structure. The first structures of, of proteins came some years later from, from some of the same laboratories. Um, and each structure that's come out since, and it's sort of significant that the protein structures were determined later than the DNA structure. And we will see this pattern emerging uh, again since that time. Each protein is really quite often its own beast. Um, and there's a lot of insight to be gained um, in every case for different enzymes, um, there's a significant investment in the pharmaceutical industry to, um, to use structural information to help them guide uh, the development of drugs, for example. So you, it's, it's difficult to generalize about the significance of uh, the uh, knowledge of molecular structures of, of proteins, <clears throat> but it's very diverse um, and it's played and continues to play a very significant role in modern molecular biology. So the range of structures and the size of systems that are being studied um, is, is certainly increasing um, with, with some, some speed. Uh, we now have just under 90,000 entries in the PDB, the database, uh, database of where all structures are sort of accumulated. And I think that we have in structural biology a couple of lessons, uh, a couple of messages for the, uh, our colleagues in, in, in different fields that I think are worth paying attention to. We've had in structural biology since 1971 stable identifiers for our the fundamental data unit in structural biology, the PDB file. Um, we've also had um, one key stable data format. We've evolved others, but that data format uh, that's that existed since then um, continues to be the most widely used. So you have browsers that can literally read files written back in those days. And this didn't happen by accident. And I think that other fields, uh, as many of you know, probably have, have really nothing to compare with this, could really benefit from, from having a close look at the PDB 
uh, how they've uh, managed to, to achieve this remarkable success. And it's not just remarkable, I think, within molecular biology. Um, many of you may know that, that biology is actually um, envied by some of the other sciences um, for the openness of our data um, and for how well organized we are with our data. And I would say within uh, biology, structural biology is, is really the, the poster child uh, for that. So I think there's really something to be learned there from, for other fields. And another thing that we have to, to offer is, uh, in many areas of biology, the visualization of data is emerging, it's challenging, and it's um, undergoing rapid development, <clears throat> um, and, and perhaps in some cases lagging behind advanced visualization techniques. And this really isn't the case in general with structural biology. Um, in fact, the visualization of, of structures uh, has been, um, has uh, evolved together with the, the evolution of, of scientific visualization, certainly, as a field. And we've been fortunate at Visby to have three great speakers over the last couple of years who've, um, and if you haven't checked out their, their videos that are available on the Visby website, I, I encourage you to do so. They're all, um, the first two are spectacular, and I'm, I'm, I really, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to Tom's talk uh, coming after mine. But all is not rosy in structures, um, and this is the case for any experimental field. We have some issues. Um, key thing is, it's just difficult to determine a structure, uh, typically around one man year for a novel structure, and in some cases, never. You may be, have you set your sights on determining the structure of a system that's important, you'd love to have the structure, and you can't solve it. And combined with the difficulties, of course, expense. It's just intrinsically more uh, complicated to determine atomic resolution 3D structures than, than it ever will be to determine uh, sequences of genomes, for example. In, in addition, there's the complexity of the data itself and the complexity of the interpretation of the data by biologists. It's intrinsically complicated to look at hundreds, thousands of molecular coordinates and uh, with work, for example, in Valerie's group uh, and others who are taking those coordinates and then calculating molecular dynamic trajectories, we then have uh, dynamics superimposed onto this complexity, uh, increasing the issue still further. Plus, we have some fundamental limitations and some errors that can creep in experimentally. And to uh, highlight those, I'm going to uh, talk, give you a little bit of detail about how structures come about. So there's two primary ways. Uh, the main way is first try to convince a protein to crystallize. Um, and if you can get it to form a regu pack regularly and then pass x-rays through it, you can get a diffraction pattern from which you can uh, calculate a crystal structure and under, good, under favorable circumstances. And the other main way, accounting for about 10% of known structures, is NMR. I'll talk about that a bit. Just to come back to crystal structures, so this is what we do in, in uh, crystallography <clears throat> is very much uh, what data visualization talks about a lot. We uh, as part of the process of determining the structure, uh, one visualizes the experimental data, which in this case is electron density, and tries to chase the chain through it. So it's the model and the data are quite often visualized simultaneously, and this is really uh, standard practice. In the case of NMR, it's more complicated because the data is not so directly related to the structure. What we've got is, uh, in an NMR spectra, um, essentially every proton, every hydrogen atom in the, in the, in the system um, above a certain threshold will, will lie somewhere on a diagonal, and pairs of protons that are physically close will have a, a cross peak represented uh, in the off diagonal. And by combining all of those signals together, um, and typically we get many thousands of them, we're able to calculate uh, structures. We don't usually have a unified structure um, because essentially the data, <clears throat> we have um, fewer constraints on structures in NMR than we do in NMR that we do in the case of crystallography. And so generally, uh, what's represented, what you'll find if you look at a PDB entries and ensemble of structures, typically represented that way. Um, for uh, researchers in the field, often this, this so-called sausage plot has become a very common way of representing um, the uncertainty. So essentially, that's the backbone of the, um, of the protein. And uh, the thickness of the sausage represents areas that are uncertain. So. We have both, in the case of both crystallography and NMR, we have a couple of minor issues that, that always crop up. And if you're not familiar with structures, it's useful to know this, that sometimes when you're looking at the PB entry for, for your protein, 
it's actually not your protein. There are modifications that have been made in order to convince that protein either to crystallize or to live in an NMR tube at sufficient concentration to be detectable uh, but, and then not to aggregate. Often amino acids are modified. Quite often uh, entire parts of the chain are removed. Uh, one, one could be looking, for example, just at the structure of a, a domain rather than the full length protein. This is extremely common. Uh, and then small pieces of the protein can get cut out. For example, in crystallography, a small region of the structure that's very mobile um, doesn't, doesn't produce a very clear diffraction pattern, and that part is simply emitted from the structure. So there are all kinds of reasons why the structure that you look at can be different in sequence even from the original sequence that where the, the structure was derived from. But there's a, key, uh, a problem that I think many people are not so aware of who are not very familiar with structures, uh, which is symmetry. <clears throat> crops up in crystal structures because, as I mentioned, to determine a structure, we need to convince it to form a crystal state, which, and it has, it has partners. <clears throat> in some cases, those partners uh, uh, between different, what are called units of the crystal, may be forming a contact that may be a so-called native contact. This might be a dimer in solution, uh, or maybe not. Maybe that's what's a so-called crystallographic contact, not a, a biologically relevant contact. And when you look at, at a entry in the PDB, it's not always apparent um, which is the correct symmetry. In fact, raw PDB files very often have the wrong symmetry, wrong in the sense that it's not the biologically relevant symmetry. They have a symmetry that's defined to be a non-redundant symmetry for crystallographic purposes. And so some interpretation needs to be done uh, if you want to, if subunit packing is important for you. Fortunately, this problem is largely handled. Um, so there's a, a, a range of programs that are available that essentially will build all symmetry-related um, uh, oligomers and assess which of those different oligomers is more likely to be the, the relevant one. And this is even better now, better news, is that it's done essentially automatically for you when you go to the PDB website. Um, there's a, uh, <clears throat> a facility here that enables you to navigate to see all of the different uh, possible or putative um, oligomeric packings for a given structure, and the one that's believed to be the right one is shown first. Um, so this is just an important thing, because very often people are looking and interested in protein-protein contacts, and it's very important to get the right oligomeric state. Um, so that's a, a trick for young players. And it turns out that in NMR, fundamentally, we don't have um, the symmetry problem in the same way that crystals do, um, because uh, we know that this, the um, the molecular system we're interrogating with NMR cannot be crystalline, otherwise we wouldn't be able to determine it. But as we know, many uh, protein structures do form symmetric oligomers, quite a large a fraction actually. And this is a problem for NMR in principle because uh, it, if, if the two monomers are totally symmetric, that means that the magnetic state of the hydrogen atoms in each, each monomer is identical and they can't be distinguished in the spectra. And um, that's actually part of my, uh, my my work in the, in the 90s was a lot to do with unraveling this symmetry problem. Uh, and there's a number of ways. Uh, one can do it uh, cal by calculation or by, um, uh, by experiment, in some cases, breaking the symmetry with so-called asymmetric labeling. Um, but uh, we were able to actually, uh, the problem can actually be in principle solved uh, purely computationally. So in addition to those more minor complexities, there are some really fundamental issues. And one is that uh, if we talk about crystal structures, you may notice that most of your uh, body isn't in a crystalline state. Uh, it's not a very natural state for proteins. And um, there's an even greater problem with a whole class of proteins, the transmembrane proteins, that it's very difficult to convince them to form crystal structures um, in, in general, and it's not always clear when they do form crystal structures if the structure they're forming in that case is actually relevant to the, the biological structure. There's a real possibility of artifacts. So one really does need to, um, to, to have a degree of skepticism. There's a number of tools available to help you assess which structures are, are likely uh, to, be, to have pot uh, potential problems. But um, there have been a small number, fortunately a small number of cases where, uh, where things have really gone wrong and um, <clears throat> so something to be aware of. But what I'm mostly going to talk about is uh, this emerging thing called the sequence structure gap. You may have remembered the figure a little while ago when I showed you this nice growth in the total size of the PDB. Uh, and we've 
we now have 90,000 structures, which is a long way up from, uh, from 1971 when we first started uh, the database. <clears throat> but uh, many of you know that there's been um, exponential, indeed hyper-exponential increases in the uh, rate of genomic sequencing. This one shows the decrease in cost of a complete human genome, uh, just gone down around $1,000 this year. And this is giving us a flood of sequence data, obviously, and that the rate at which sequence data is generated is far outpacing our ability, obviously, to determine crystal structures or cell structures by NMR. And this general problem uh, interest, started to interest me um, around about the, the 2000, um, the time of the genome. And at that time, uh, I'd come from the structural biology background, and I, I joined a, a biotech startup company called Lyme Bioscience. And we had a partnership with uh, the company Celera that did the first um, commercial human genome. And my role in that whole uh, scenario was to try to leverage the structured data uh, with respect to this emerging genomics data to work out a way in which we could um, benefit from these growing number of structures, but somehow map them on to this much faster growing rate of, of sequence information. In general, the problem is there's, there's a lot of structures out there, as I mentioned, 90,000, but if you're coming in from, from a given sequence, which ones should you look at? It's not always clear because the mapping from a sequence to a structure is, uh, is not one-to-one. -one. Certainly, uh, it's a complex interrelationship. And uh, so back in 2004, we published this method. Uh, we called it SRS3D at the time. Uh, it, was, it was a commercial product, so many of you probably don't know about it. But it was dissolved to sort of uh, essentially solve this problem, to map all sequences onto all structures, um, and then to present the results in an integrated way and make the interrogation of finding all related structures for a sequence very, very easy. So just concept was you type in an identifier, a protein name or a protein identifier, and we pre-calculated the mapping of each protein sequence onto all 3D structures. So this represents a concise visual summary of every structure in the database that's at all similar to your sequence. And just by clicking on one of these um, representations, you can bring up a structure, you can see your um, yeah, you can see your, your sequence mapped onto a 3D structure. Quite often, um, a given protein sequence won't have a structure, but there'll be something in the database that's quite similar. Um, so you can get structural information. You can map SNPs, for example, onto uh, a, a structure that's highly related and get an idea about the, uh, the biological context behind a given SNP or, or other properties like exon boundaries, uh, protein binding sites, and so forth. And what was really interesting for us was not only integrating sequences and structures, but also genomic features. And I guess the most prominent one of those is really, really SNPs. So the idea of looking at coding mutation, coding polymorphisms, and seeing where they occur in a structure, this can give you, um, in some cases, uh, much clearer insight into what the effect on the function of the protein of that polymorphism may be. So that was a commercial product way back when. And uh, about four years ago, um, when I I started up this project again. Uh, what had happened, the company had collapsed since then, like a lot of the biotech startups around 2000. Uh, and the company that had bought the intellectual rights, I managed to convince them to release the code behind SRS3D, um, uh, make, making it free and open source. And so we've been launching this project again, uh, and with particular effort over the last year. And uh, there's a problem with the name because uh, the SRS part is still proprietary and still a commercial product. And what we, we're building based on this code base, uh, this is no longer related to SRS, so we can't just call it 3D, or maybe you can D3 now, but it seems a bit redundant. So we've come up with a, a new name, Aquaria. And if the, uh, if my browser works, I'm able, I can give you a quick demonstration. So Aquaria is not a released, um, um, it's not a released um, uh, project right now, so we're still, um, we're still in the development. Um, but we are aiming for a release date um, around the middle of the year. And essentially what we do is for each sequence, which is very easy to find, just simply type in a, a sequence name or identifier. We have, as I mentioned, pre-calculated this consolidated representation of all 3D structures that are in any way related. Uh, and um, in this case, we are actually clustering them by where these structures match to your sequence. So these. Each, each cluster here represents, in this case, nine 3D structures that match to the sequence you're interested in. And in this case, they only match in, in a certain um, part of the, of the molecule. And uh, what we're able to do is uh, expand out those nine and 
we can give you more information about them, the oligomeric states, which other uh, proteins are uh, taking part in, that, um, in those complexes. And by simply choosing a structure, uh, you can load it into this um, Java 3D-based viewer that we developed um, going back now uh, just over 10 years ago. Um, and this uh, has some nice features in that it takes uh, advantage of accelerated um, hardware acceleration um, and uh, has a very nice coupling of um, the stru structure coloring with the sequence coloring. So you're able to sort of click on one part of the structure and automatically uh, the corresponding part of the sequence is selected. So it's very easy to navigate from structure to sequence and clicking on the sequence, uh, somewhere in the sequence will uh, navigate you to that part of the structure. So you can go from sequence structure from, and structure to sequence uh, quite easily. <clears throat> and one of the key things about this um, view was not just to enable this because a number of other viewers do that, although we think we do it. Our goal was to develop the most um, user-friendly viewer essentially designed for uh, molecular biologists, biochemists who are not primarily structural biologists, but who would like to access and use structural information. So we're using uh, standard conventions of uh, mouse and, and so forth to op operate the viewer rather than using command line languages, which are typically, uh, scripting languages were typically done by three-dimensional viewers. But the other thing is having, having defined a mapping from, from a, your sequence of interest onto a structure that's related, uh, we can bring up features in this case. Uh, these are domain uh, predictions, and we can then define um, quite easily a mapping that can just take this uh, feature set and, um, and map them onto um, to a 3D structure. So it's easy to, um, to color structures in this case by domains or, or other feature sets like, like uh, SNPs. And we also have a concept of, of putting not just coloring on the structure, but actually putting hyperlinks. So the structure becomes a place to actually put information, uh, for example, about a given residue uh, and the, what the effect of particular variations in that residue position might, might be. So we have some ambitious plans to expand this um, and along the lines of Wikipedia to enable community curation and annotation directly of these uh, sequence of structure relationships. And uh, we are having a demonstration of this, um, of this uh, uh, emerging uh, uh, tool, which will be a, a freely available service, uh, as I mentioned, scheduled for at least sometime in the middle of the year. Um, we're having a demonstration of this um, at the afternoon poster session. So please come along and uh, if you're interested and we can take you through some of its features. So um, we're also trying a couple of things to, um, to, to, to manage the problem of, 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 of visual complexity. Um, so one of the nice features of, of a, uh, a service that um, takes advantage of accelerated hardware is we can fairly easily scale it um, to, to various sizes. We also have, um, just so the sound doesn't go on. We also have um, been playing with alternative ways of, of interfacing because it's never easy to sort of control a 3D structure. What, which, which button should I press for the right rotation around the z-axis or the y-axis and so forth? So we, we built recently a connector to the Microsoft Connect. Um, probably the main use case is really for situations like this, that in a demonstration situation or on a display wall, it would be relatively easy to sort of just grab control uh, and, and rotate things around. Um, and if you check out Art Olson's talk from Visby 2011, he had some fantastic demonstrations about the use of augmented reality here, and we're very interested in moving to that direction ourselves. So I'm now going to just in the last few minutes highlight a couple of directions where I think structural biology um, uh, has to go, and some ideas maybe about how it can get there. So. And some of these ideas come from uh, the, the Darkstool meeting that, some, that many of you would know about that happened, I think it was in October last year. Uh, we had a very interesting group of people, including some uh, Art Olson and a number of other prominent structural biologists, together with representatives from the, the computer science visualization community uh, and other areas of biology. And we were really thinking about what is the future of um, the combination of data visualization, uh, structural biology, and, and, other, and how can structural biology interface with other sciences. And so one thing that I'm very concerned about or very interested in and excited about actually is, is what are we going to do with all these genomic features? When we have a genome that costs one dollar per entire genome, we're going to start to have for each protein thousands, tens of thousands, and literally ultimately millions of genetic variation, information about genetic variants and which disease states they're correlated with. How are we going to organize that information and make it 
and, 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 and use it together with structural information. And we have some ideas about that which we can demonstrate to you if you come and join us for the tutorial afterwards. There's another area which is um, really one of the other superstars in biology, which is uh, bioimaging data. Um, and this is a data set that I'm, I found fascinating. Uh, for a time, it was the, the largest image, uh, probably under some ways of defining that, it was, it was a large image. It made a big impact in, in the media uh, last year. Uh, it's, I think it was 281 gigapixels. And what this is is a, a many different electron micrographs tiled together uh, and an image of a, of a developing fish embryo. So the whole embryo is really just a couple of, a couple of millimeters long. Um, but you're able to basically just zoom right down uh, into different parts of this image. And this is freely available online and I encourage you to check it out. Right down from the tissue scale down to, in this case, these are muscle cells. Um, and you can see at this level the uh, actin mice and filaments, uh, how they're arranged. And these things are in the PDB. So this literally data sets now that connect directly atomic resolution structures all the way up to tissue level biology. Um, and this is exciting, um, but the tools to make that, those connections easy to navigate and easy to use and easy to gain uh, insight from, those, those tools really are, uh, the, the, the development efforts there are really just, just beginning. So the final area is systems biology, um, uh, yet another exciting area. And I was very pleased that Cole articulated this uh, to some extent quite clearly when he talked about the issue of different splice variants something that I'm uh, quite interested in myself, that, that what we need is this sort of connected infrastructure to make, uh, to look at the data from these different domains and make it um, understandable. There's uh, actually, in, in the case of RNA structural biology, there's some very nice tools that are out there uh, that were reviewed in the Nature Methods issue that we published, uh, review that we published in 2010. Um, I think they're, they're, they're beautiful and they're the way to go, uh, but there's really a lot more work to do, particularly in, in proteins, to make this more navigable. And, one thing that, that came up when we were creating that review is uh, Bang uh, put me into contact with Gail McGill, who did these uh, extraordinary uh, evo ev evocative images that suggest how maybe in the future, instead of having these sort of uh, abstract geometric forms in, when, we, when we draw uh, systems and pathways, we can have representations of the actual shape of the players involved, which and just looking at the shape can often give you an insight into the function. And I think it's interesting how, uh, and I'm quite excited really, that this year's meeting we have um, uh, quite a number, a number of different tools like this. Uh, this is one of the posters that was submitted. Um, really living this idea of telling a biological story about a system using the parts themselves, using uh, not, you know, again, not these abstract representations, but but representation is really based on the reality, as far as we understand it, um, of how these, these players look and how they interact. And of course, the, um, how would I say, the, um, the, I think the outstanding example is this other biomedic, biomedical animators, uh, in, including Drew Berry, you know, showing, in this case, how, how DNA replicates. Um, uh, this is obviously more for outreach, perhaps more for education. I still think there's a lot of insight that biologists can, can gain by looking at this. And, uh, and just to mention and follow up on a point that uh, Kate Patterson mentioned that we, I'm very fortunate to have started a collaboration with Drew, uh, which came out of Visby, and we're uh, having an initial event um, in May, so please come. So finally, to wrap up, as the time is over, so we're faced with a deluge of data. And in structural biology particularly, there's just so many things we could do, so many different parts of this data. We could use structures to help gain insight in so many different directions. And it's frightening, but if you have the right attitude, perhaps it can also be seen as an opportunity um, to, uh, to benefit from this data. And, and the tools and the, the approaches that we're using is, are based around this insight of um, making it easy to gain insight from this data rather than being overwhelmed by it. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge first the SRS 3D group back in the Lyme Bioscience days, and particularly Andrea Schaffer-Hans, who's um, now at the University of Munich, and uh, is continuing to collaborate on this project and my team at Garvin uh, and CSRO. <clears throat> and thank you for your attention.